section 10 of A Book of Fairy Tales. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sash Elliott. A Book of Fairy Tales by Sabine Baring Gould. Beauty and the Beast. There was a merchant man once who was very rich. He had three daughters and he spared no expense to provide them with an excellent education. His daughters were beautiful, but the youngest so excelled her sisters that, from earliest childhood, she was called the Beauty, and afterwards this name slipped into, simply, Beauty. But the real cause why she was so much more admired than her sisters was that she was amiable, and they were not, and the sweetness of her disposition shone out in her face and made it doubly sweet. No frown ever spoiled her fair brow, no pout was ever on her pleasant lips. She possessed the charm of a good temper, which makes even a plain face agreeable. The merchant's elder daughters were idle, ill-humoured and proud, and people did not consider them as beautiful, because they saw only the bad temper that was in the expression of their faces. The pride of the young ladies was so great that they despised all such as were of their own rank in life and wished to be the friends of noble ladies and princesses. They hunted after grand acquaintances, and met with many mortifications accordingly. They gave themselves great airs, and, to show the world how high in life they were, they held up their noses. Their whole time was spent in balls, operas, and visiting and driving about. Meanwhile, Beauty kept to her books, and, when not at work, she loved in kindly way to go among the sick and poor and comfort them. Thus it came about that she was as much beloved by the poor as she was admired by the rich. As it was well known that their father was a well-to-do man, many merchants asked the girls in marriage. But all these offers were refused, because the two eldest daughters had set their minds on marrying only nobles, and the youngest had no wish to be married at all. Beauty's great desire was to be with her father when he was old and feeble, and to be then his comfort. One unhappy day, the merchant returned home, very downcast, to inform his children that his ships had been wrecked, his head clerk had defrauded him, and that the firms which owed him money were bankrupt. He was, therefore, a ruined man. Beauty wept because her father was unfortunate and unhappy, and asked him what was to be done. Alack, dear child, he replied, I must sell this house and go live in a cottage in the country, and we shall have to work with our hands to put bread into our mouths. Well, father, said Beauty, I can spin and knit and sew very neatly. I dare say I shall be able to help you. Their older daughters said nothing, but resolved to marry such of their rejected lovers as were richest. They speedily found, however, that their rejected lovers rejected all their advances, now that they were poor. On the other hand, such as had admired beauty pressed their services on her, and would gladly have shared their fortunes with her. She, however, could not think of deserting her father when he was reduced to low estate, she felt she must abide by him and work for him. Very soon, the grand house in town was sold, as well as all the rich furniture, and the merchant and his daughters retired into the country. Beauty now rose at four o'clock every morning. She cleaned the house, laid and lighted the fires, prepared the breakfast, and put flowers on the table. Then she cooked the dinner and made the house tidy. She was happy, and sang like a lark over her work, and slept peacefully, and had pleasant dreams. Meanwhile, her sisters grew peevish, dissatisfied, and miserable. They would not work, and as they had no occupation and no amusement, the days dragged along and seemed as though they would never end. They did nothing but regret the past and grumble over the present. As they had no one to admire them, they neglected their personal appearance and became veritable dowdies. Perhaps they perceived that the contrast between their sister and themselves was not to their advantage, for they became spiteful in their manner to beauty, and held up their hands and declared that she had always been fit only to be a servant. It is clear as daylight, they said to beauty, that nature made you to occupy a menial position, and now you are in your proper place. As for us, we are ladies. We can't soil our fingers, we can't dust the furniture, we can't scrub the floor. We are above such things. The merchant heard, after a while, that there was some chance of retrieving part of his fortune if he made a journey to a country where one of his richest vessels had been wrecked. He must claim what had been recovered from the sea. 
Accordingly, he bade his daughters farewell, and he did so in a hopeful spirit, for he believed he would get back enough to make their life more comfortable. Before leaving, he asked his daughters what they would desire him to bring for them on his return as a little token that he remembered them. The eldest asked for a diamond necklace. The second wished for a whole suite of pearls. The youngest said, Dear father, bring me a white rose. So the father kissed all his daughters and departed. He was successful and had recovered so much of his property that he hoped to reopen his business and in time recover all that was lost. When he prepared to return home, he remembered the requests of his daughters and bought diamonds for the eldest and pearls for the second, but he sought everywhere in vain for a white rose. This distressed him greatly as his youngest daughter was his favourite child. Now, as he was on his way home, he lost his way in a wood. Night was closing in, and as the merchant was aware that there were wolves, bears and wild boars in that country, he was very anxious to find a shelter for the night. Presently, he perceived in the distance a twinkling light, and he urged his horse in that direction. But, to his surprise, instead of coming to a woodman's hut, he found himself in front of a magnificent castle, to which led a stately avenue, composed of orange and lemon trees hung with fruit. He did not hesitate to pass down this avenue, and, at the end, he came to the steps leading to the front gate, and through the open door shone the light that had attracted him. He entered, having first knocked at the door, and looked round him expecting to see servants, but no one responded to his knock, and the hall was wholly deserted. He passed through several galleries and empty rooms, all illuminated and all empty, and finally stayed his course in a smaller apartment where a fire was burning, and a couch was prepared as if for someone to lie on it. Being very tired and cold, he cast himself down on the couch and fell asleep. After a pleasant and refreshing slumber, he awoke, and found he was still alone, but a little table stood by him, and on it was spread a delicious repast. As he was extremely hungry, he sat at the table and partook all of the good things on it. Then he threw himself on the couch again, and again fell asleep. When he awoke, the morning sun shone into the room, the little table was still at his side, but on it was now spread an excellent breakfast. The merchant began now to be very uneasy at the intense stillness of the house, and perplexed at seeing no one. He left the little room and entered the garden, which was beautifully laid out, and was full of flowers. Well, said the merchant to himself, this wonderful place seems to have no master. I will go home and bring my daughters to it, and we shall be able to claim it as our home, for I discovered it, and it belongs, as far as I can see, to no one. He then went to fetch his horse, and, as he turned down the path to the stable, he saw a hedge of white roses on each side of it. Thereat, the merchant remembered the request of his youngest daughter, and he plucked one to take to her. Immediately, he was alarmed by hearing a horrible noise. Turning in the direction of the sound, he saw a frightful beast, which seemed to be very angry, and which exclaimed, "'Who gave you permission to gather my roses? Was it not enough that I suffered you to lie on my couch, and warm yourself at my fire, and eat my supper and breakfast? Your insolence shall not go unpunished.' The merchant, terrified at these words and threats, dropped the rose, and casting himself on his knees, cried, "'Forgive me, sir, I am sincerely grateful for your hospitality, which was so profuse that I hardly thought you would grudge me one rose.' The beast's anger was not mitigated by this speech. "'I pay no regard to your excuses,' said he. "'You shall most certainly die.' "'Alas!' exclaimed the merchant. "'Oh, beauty, beauty, why did you ask this fatal thing of me?' The white rose you desired will be the death of your father. The beast asked the merchant the meaning of this exclamation, and the merchant then related the story of his misfortunes and of the requests made by his daughters. It cost me nearly all I recovered of my fortune, said he, to buy the diamonds and pearls for my eldest girls. I did not think I was doing any harm in plucking the poor little white rose for my youngest. The beast considered for a while, and then said, I will pardon you on one condition that is, that you will give me one of your daughters. Oh, exclaimed the merchant, if I were so cruel as to buy my own life at the expense of one of my children, what excuse could I make to bring her here? No excuse is needed, answered the beast. If she comes at all, she will come willingly. Let me see if any one of them will be brave enough, and loves you dearly enough, to come here and save your life. You seem to be an honest man. 
I give you a month in which to return home and propose to one of your daughters to come here to me. If none of them be willing, then I expect you, on your honour, to return here to your death. Say goodbye to them forever. The merchant reluctantly accepted this proposal. He did not think any of his daughters would come, but it reprieved him for one month and gave him an opportunity of saying farewell to them and of settling his affairs. He promised to return at the appointed time and then asked permission to set off at once. But the beast would not allow this till the next day. Then, said he, you will find a horse ready for you. Go in and eat your dinner and await my further orders. The poor merchant, more dead than alive, went back into the palace and into the same room in which he had rested before. There he found a most delicious meal prepared for him. He was, however, in no mood to eat, and if he swallowed a few mouthfuls, it was only lest he should anger the beast by refusing all food from his table. When he had finished, he heard a trampling in the passages, and, shortly, the monstrous beast appeared, who repeated the terms of the agreement they had made, and he added, "'Do not get up tomorrow until after sunrise, until you have heard a bell ring. Then you will find your breakfast prepared for you here, and the horse you are to ride will be ready in the courtyard. He will bring you back again when you come with your daughter a month hence.' Farewell, take a white rose for beauty, and remember your engagement. The merchant was only too glad when the beast went away, and though he could not sleep for sadness of heart, yet he lay down on the couch. Next morning, after a hasty breakfast, he went to gather the rose for beauty, mounted the horse, and rode swiftly away. The gloomy thoughts that weighed on his mind were not dispersed when he drew up at his cottage door. His daughters, who had been uneasy at his long absence, were prodigal of their embraces, and seeing him ride home on such a splendid horse, they felt quite sure that he had been successful in his journey. He gave his elder daughters the gems and pearls they had desired, and, as he handed the rose to Beauty, he sadly said, "'You little know, my darling, what this has cost me.' This saying greatly excited the curiosity of his children, and they gave him no rest till he had told them the whole story from beginning to end. The elder daughters urged him to break his promise and remain at the cottage, but their father said a promise was a promise, whether made to a king or a pauper, a man or a beast, and that he must fulfil it. Then the two eldest were very angry with Beauty, and told her that it was all her fault. If she had asked for something sensible, then this would not have happened. If it be my fault, answered Beauty meekly, it is only fitting that I should suffer for it. I will, therefore, go back with my father to the palace of the beast. At first her father would not hear of this, but Beauty was firm. As the time drew nearer, she divided all her little possessions between her sisters and said goodbye to all she loved. Now it must be told that when Beauty had received the white rose, she put it in water, and when she had heard how it was won and what it entailed, she had wept nightly over it, and her tears falling on it seemed to have preserved it in its beauty, for at the end of the month it was as fresh as when first picked, and the scent was so sweet that it perfumed the whole house. She put the white rose in her bosom, when the day came for her departure, and she mounted on a pillion behind her father to depart. The horse seemed to fly rather than gallop, and Beauty would have enjoyed the journey if it were not for the dreadful prospect of the beast at the end of it. Her father constantly urged her to dismount and turn back, but she would not hearken to this. At last they reached the avenue of orange trees, and then a wonderful sight was seen. Every orange was like a globe of light, the oranges were deep yellow and the lemons pale yellow and all shone like lamps. Moreover, beautiful lights played about the palace and sweet music murmured among the trees. The beast must be very hungry, said Beauty, if he makes such rejoicing over getting such a little mouthful as myself. The horse now stopped at the foot of the flight of steps leading to the gate and when she had dismounted, her father led her through the halls and galleries to the little room in which he had rested and began regaled when there on his former visit. Again the fire was burning, and on the table a lavish supper was spread. The merchant knew that this was meant for them, and Beauty, who was rather less frightened now that she had passed through so many rooms without seeing the beast, was willing to begin, for her long ride had made her hungry. They had hardly finished eating before they heard, Tramp! Tramp! Stump! Stump! It was the sound of the beast approaching, and Beauty clung to her father in terror, which was heightened when she saw how greatly alarmed he was. But when the beast entered, like a brave and a courteous girl, she stood up, mastered her fear, and making a low curtsy, she said, I thank you, Mr. Beast, for my pretty white rose. 
Then the beast was pleased. He saw the little flower in her bosom, looking white and fresh as when first picked, and he said, somewhat gently, "'Did you come quite willingly, Beauty?' "'Yes, Mr. Beast,' said Beauty, and dropped another curtsy. "'And will you be willing to remain with me when your father is gone? "'I will not eat you. "'My food is only crystallised rose and violet leaves. "'I eat nothing more solid or less aesthetic.' "'Yes, Mr. Beast,' answered Beauty, "'and the thought that she would not to be eaten revived her courage, "'and she dropped another little curtsy. "'I am well pleased with you,' said the Beast. "'You shall stay. "'As for you,' he now turned to the merchant, "'at sunrise to-morrow you must depart. "'When the bell rings, rise quickly and eat your breakfast, "'and you will find the same horse waiting to take you home. "'But remember, you must never venture to seek my palace again.' "'Then, turning to Beauty, he said, "'Take your father into the next room "'and help him to choose presents for your sisters. "'There are two portmanteaus there. "'Fill them with whatever you like to send home. "'All are yours and at your disposal.' Then the beast made a clumsy bow and put his paw to his heart and said, "'Good-bye, Beauty. Good-bye, Merchant Man.' Beauty was very sorrowful to have to part with her father and much dismayed at the thought of being left alone in the great palace with no one but the beast. However, she promptly obeyed his orders. The room they entered was full of the costliest objects, the most splendid dresses and the richest jewellery. After making a selection, she put them in the portmanteau which she intended to contain the presents for her sisters. Then she found a trunk full of gold coins, and with them she stuffed the second portmanteau, which was for her father. But Beauty and her father much doubted whether the horse could carry the load. However, on reaching the courtyard, there they saw two horses beside that on which the merchant had ridden. They moved the portmanteaus down and strapped them on the pack horse's backs, then the merchant bade his daughter a tender farewell with many tears and rode away. Then Beauty wept bitterly and wandered sadly back to the room in which she had eaten. She soon found herself so sleepy that she threw herself on the couch and closed her eyes and was at once in the world of dreams. Now, in her dreams she saw something very strange. She thought that there stood before her a prince, handsomer than any man she had ever seen, wearing a crown of white roses on his head. He said to her, Beauty, your fate is not as forlorn as you suppose. Be true-hearted as you are beautiful, and all will be well in the end. Beauty awoke, after a long sleep, much refreshed. She then began to explore the palace. The first room she entered was lined with looking-glasses, and Beauty saw herself reflected on every side. She then saw a bracelet hanging down from a chandelier. She took it, looked at it, and saw that it was hung a locket and in this locket was the portrait of the very prince she had seen in her dream. The next room she entered was tapestried round with foliage, and it was full of musical instruments. Beauty knew how to play some of them, and she amused herself for some time trying them, and playing the different ballad tunes that came into her head. First she sang, There was a fair maiden, all forlorn, with hay, with ho for the rain, and she sat herself down, all under a thorn, the poppies are red in the grain. Next, she sang, There rode a knight when the moon shone bright, he rode to the lady's hall. He sang her a lay, bade her come away, and follow him at his call. He courted her many a long winter night, and many a short winter day. And he laid in wait, both early and late, for to take her sweet life away. Then, she sang, There came an earl a-riding by, a gypsy maid espied he. O oh, not brown maid, to her he said, I prithee, come away with me. I take you up, I'll carry you home, I'll put a safeguard over you. Your slippers shall be of Spanish leather, and silken stockings all of blue. And last of all, she sang, Green gravel, green gravel, the grass is so green, the fairest young damsel that ever was seen. O oh, beauty, O oh, beauty, your true love is dead, he sends you a letter to turn round your head. Then Beauty was tired of singing and playing, and she went into the next room, which was a library, and it was full of books. She pulled down several and looked at them, and thought that surely it would take her all her life to read the books she saw there. Then she walked into the garden, and wondrous were the flowers and the fruit there. Never had she seen so many and such beautiful flowers, never had she tasted such delicious fruit. At last day declined, and she came indoors. A brilliant light illuminated all the rooms. She found supper prepared for her, and she seated herself to eat. Then she heard, 
tramp, tramp, stump, stump, and in came the beast. He asked her if she thought she could be happy in his palace, and Beauty answered that everything was so beautiful that she would be very hard to please if she could not be happy. Then he asked if he might sit down and eat his meal with her. "'Oh, what shall I say?' cried Beauty, for she knew that she could not eat in comfort with him munching crystallised rose leaves and violets out of a bonbon box on the other side of the table. "'Say exactly what you think,' he replied. "'Oh, no, Beast,' said Beauty hastily. "'Since you will not—' "'Good night, Beauty,' he said, and she responded, "'Good night, Beast.' When she was asleep, she again dreamed of the mysterious prince. Next day, she found a room in which were silks and canvas and needles and all sorts of articles for embroidery. Then she entered an aviary full of beautiful birds, which were so tame that they flew to Beauty as soon as they saw her and perched on her shoulder and hands. The day passed a little more heavily than the last, and Beauty began to long for someone to talk to and even was pleased when at supper she heard the tramp, tramp, stump, stump of the beast coming along the passages. She now put a chair on the side of the table opposite her, and when the beast said, "'May I sit down and eat with you, Beauty?' she answered, "'Oh, please do, beast!' That night she dreamed of the prince again, and he smiled at her and looked pleased. Next day she walked in the woods, and she saw deer there, fleet and graceful, and she came on fish ponds in which were gold and silver fish. She went to the music room and tried to play and sing, but became tired of her loneliness and wished greatly for supper when the beast would appear and she could talk with him and hear him talk. When day declined and the palace was lighted up for supper, then she waited impatiently for the tramp, tramp, stump, stump, and when the beast came in she ran to meet him, dropped a curtsy and said, "'Please, beast, can you play and sing?' "'Yes, beauty.' "'Would you play and sing with me sometimes?' she asked. "'Certainly, Beauty, if you wish it.' Next day, when she entered the music room, the Beast was there, and she found that not only could he play very charmingly on many instruments, but also could sing a rich bass. They made together quite a charming little concert, singing duets and playing different instruments, and this wore the morning away. In the afternoon, Beauty was quite dull by herself, She wandered in the library, looking at one book after another, and she could not choose which to read. So at supper, she ran along the gallery to meet the beast. Directly she heard his tramp, tramp, stump, stump, and, dropping a little curtsy, she said, "'Please, beast, will you tell me what books to read?' "'Certainly, beauty,' he answered, and next day she found him in the library, and he read with her and explained to her difficult passages, and so a very pleasant morning was passed.' In the afternoon, Beauty walked in the garden, admiring the flowers and wishing that she knew their names. At supper, when she heard the tramp, tramp, stump, stump of the beast, she ran to meet him and, taking one of his paws in her hand, said, "'Please, beast, will you walk in the garden with me?' "'Certainly, Beauty,' he answered, and next day, when she went into the garden, there he was, and he was able to tell her all about the flowers, their names and their properties, and whence they came.' That evening, at supper, she said to the beast, "'Please, beast, may I make you a pair of slippers?' "'Certainly, beauty,' he answered. "'But my feet are very big and clumsy.' "'Oh,' said she, "'not half so big and clumsy as those of an elephant.' So she amused herself in embroidering for the beast a pair of slippers. The ground was turquoise blue, and on it were white roses with stamens of gold, and the pods for seed were scarlet. Never before or after were such beautiful slippers made. That night she dreamed that she saw the prince. He looked at her, smiling, and showed that he wore her slippers, which he had made for the beast, and they had shrunk to the size of his finely formed feet. One day she was in the forest, and she thought, "'Oh, how nice it would be to ride out hunting, but how dull to ride all alone!' So that evening, at supper, she ran to the beast, which she heard his tramp, tramp, stump, stump, and, catching hold of both his paws, she said, "'Please, beast, will you go hunting with me?' "'Certainly, Beauty,' he answered. Next day there was a fine hunt, and Beauty enjoyed herself vastly. One day, when Beauty was walking in the garden with the beast, she passed with him by the hedge of white roses, and she put out her hand and picked one. Then he said to her, "'Beauty, will you marry me? If so, give me the white rose.' 
Oh, what shall I say? cried Beauty, for she was sorry to offend the beast, who had been so kind to her, and such an agreeable companion, and so eager to forestall all her wishes. But, at the same time, he was a beast. He said, seeing her hesitation, Say just what you think. Then Beauty answered hastily, Oh, no beast! That night she dreamed of her prince, and that he looked sad and woe-begone. So everything went on for a time, until at last, happy as she was, Beauty began to long for the sight of her father and sisters. One evening, seeing her look very sad, and her eyes red, the beast asked her what was the matter. Beauty had quite ceased to be afraid of him. She knew that he was gentle and kind in spite of his ferocious appearance, and clever and learned in spite of his being such an animal, and quite dainty and courteous in his manners, though a beast. She answered that she was longing to see her home once more. Upon hearing this, the beast seemed greatly affected. He sighed and said, "'Ah, beauty, will you desert your poor beast like this? Is it because you hate me that you want to leave me?' "'No, dear beast,' answered beauty softly. "'Indeed I do not hate you, and it would make me very unhappy if I thought I should never see and talk with you again. But I do long greatly to see my father.' Let me go, if only for two months, and I promise to return to you and stay with you for the rest of my life. The beast said, I can refuse you nothing, and that you well know. Take the four boxes you will find in the room next to your own, and fill them with whatever you like to take away with you. But remember your promise, and return when two months have expired, or you will find your faithful beast dead. You will not need any carriage to bring you back. Only say goodbye to your father and sisters the night before you come away. And then, in your room, turn this ring I give you on your finger and say, I wish to be with my beast again. As soon as Beauty was by herself, she hastened to fill the boxes with all the rare and precious things she saw about her. Then she went to bed, but could hardly sleep for joy. And when at last she did begin to dream of her beloved prince, she saw him lying stretched on the grass, sad and weeping. When she opened her eyes, she could hardly believe her senses. She was in a very different place from the palace of the beast. The room was neat and comfortable, but not splendid. Where could she be? She dressed herself hastily, and then saw that the boxes she had packed were in the room. While she was wondering where she was, she heard her father's voice. She at once left the room, and, seeing him, threw herself into his arms. She was, in fact, in the new house to which her father had removed from the cottage, when his fortunes were improved. Her sisters were greatly astonished to see her. All embraced her with demonstrations of the greatest joy, but her sisters were not in heart glad to see her. Their jealousy was not extinguished. She was made to tell her story, and it filled all with astonishment. But when she said that her stay with them was limited to two months, then her father was sorrowful, but her sisters secretly rejoiced. Her father had much to tell her, and her sisters had made many acquaintances, and the time was spent in going about making visits and in receiving company. Nevertheless, somehow, Beauty did not feel as happy as she had been with her beast. The time had come at last when she ought to return. But her father was so sorrowful when she spoke of departure, and there was always something arranged for the next day for which she was expected to remain, so that she did not fulfil her promise exactly. Besides, she so loved her father that she could not make up her mind to bid him goodbye. One night she had a dreadful dream. She thought she was back again in the beast's palace and that she was walking through the room seeking him. Not finding him anywhere, she went into the garden and called him, but received no answer. At last, having reached a portion of the shrubberies that was allowed to run wild, she heard groans issuing from a cave. She penetrated into it and found the beast prostrate on the ground and apparently dying. He reproached her with having forgotten him and broken her promise and reminded her of what he had said, that her absence protracted beyond the two months allotted to her would be death to him. Beauty was so terrified by this dream that she sprang from her bed, ran to her father's room, roused him, said farewell. Then she did the same to her sisters and, still agitated with the thoughts of the dying beast, turned her ring and wished herself back in his palace. Hardly had she done this before she was again in the little chamber in which she had spent so many agreeable hours. She looked about. No beast was there. Then, although it was night, she ran out into the garden, calling him and seeking him. She was still searching for him when the grey of dawn appeared. 
then she was able to find her way, and she sought the wilderness she had been in, in her dream, and at last lit on the cavern of which she had dreamed. In fact, from this now issued the most lamentable sighs and groans. She ran in and saw the poor beast stretched on the earth, and evidently exceedingly weak and suffering. "'Oh, beast! Beast!' she cried. "'I am so sorry, so heartily sorry, that I have delayed my return. Oh, tell me you will recover!' "'Nothing will restore me but one thing,' he answered in a faint voice. "'Tell me what that is, and it is yours.' "'The rose,' he answered. "'The white rose. "'You will find it growing over the mouth of this cave. "'But remember, if you give me that, you give me yourself with it. "'You accept me as your husband.' "'In a moment, without speaking, Beauty sprang out of the cave "'and hastily plucked a beautiful white rose that hung down over the mouth.' Returning to the poor beast, she gave it to him and said, "'Dear beast, indeed I am yours. I love you with all my heart.' "'Will you kiss me on my snout?' asked the beast. "'Indeed, indeed I will,' answered Beauty. At that moment the sun rose and poured its golden beams into the cave, and made the walls glitter and twinkle like a cave of rainbow, and indeed they were all of ruby, carbuncle, amethyst, topaz, emerald, and every imaginable stone.' The reflection was so dazzling that Beauty, having kissed the beast, covered her eyes. When she drew her hands away, he had disappeared. In his place stood her long-dreamed-of beautiful prince. Then he took her by the hand and said, "'Dear Beauty, to you, to your faithfulness and goodness, I owe my delivery. I have been bewitched by a cruel fairy who said I should remain in the form of a hideous monster until some maiden would consent to be my wife, and in token of her consent, Give me a white rose and kiss me on the mouth. This is my palace. I have an immense kingdom and innumerable treasures. You shall be my queen and we will make your father happy and, if possible, your sisters shall be made contented. I shall never forget what you have done for me and all my life shall be devoted to rendering you happy. Notes on Beauty and the Beast One of Madame de Beaumont's tales and it is the only one of hers that has lived and it has lived for one reason only, that it is not an original creation of her brain, but is based on a universally known myth of a woman, loving and consenting to union with a transformed prince who has a monstrous shape. Very generally the sexes are reversed, and the young lady is transformed into a serpent or a dragon. I know a certain precipice in the Montefontau, in the Alps, where a maiden changed into the form of a monstrous toad, with poison dribbling from her lips, was said to be doomed to squat in a cave till a youth would kiss her on the mouth. End of section 10